Hello, my friends, and welcome to an epilogue of History That Doesn't Suck. I am your professor, Greg Jackson, and joined by the one and only C.L. Salazar. Hey, everyone. So, it's time, yes, finally. It is time to wrap up Reconstruction and the Indian Wars. Yes. Yes, it is. That was a that was a dense few episodes. It was dense. And, you know, we tried to give the good broad overview and tell the stories that needed telling and get the facts out there that needed to get out there. But it was a lot to fit into seven episodes. It was pretty heavy stuff. Yes. Um, and, hey, we'll get to all that. Uh, we will also get to CL, your... You're departing. That's right. But we'll save that yes. conversation for the very end. We will save that for the very end. Because uh, 2020 is the year of everything. <laughs> Ending. <laughs> so Josh leaves. You're going. It's all good. Okay, but we'll get to that. Mm -hmm. um, first off, the usual. Let's do corrections. and then, Yeah, the, the stuff we got wrong. <laughs> yes. And then we'll get into digesting Reconstruction and the Indian Wars. Mm -hmm. Let's do it. All right. So uh, we've got... Two little pronunciations to bring up. We're actually hearkening all the way back to the Civil War here. Yeah. All, all the way back. I mean, it, it really wasn't that long ago, I suppose. I mean, on the podcast, it was, it was a pretty long time ago lit, in a literal sense. Sure. So uh, in 51, we talked about, now I'm going to mispronounce it. We talked about Aquia Creek. I hope I said it right this time. Nope, it's a quiet. There Great. it is. There is. I probably just said it the same way I said on episode 51. Yeah, but we were corrected by Christine from Virginia. So thank you, Christine. Yes, yes. Much, much appreciated. We do like to pronounce things the way that the locals pronounce it. And we go to great lengths for that. But, you know, sometimes we, we just can't. Yeah, sometimes we fail. <laughs> so That's so how it is. Whatever way we said it, it's actually a quiet. Yes, it's the way CL says it. Don't listen to the way I say it. It's the way CL <laughs> says it. So similarly, still in Virginia, uh, I believe I said more of a lure, kind of a mm -hmm. deeper you are. And uh, Christine informed us that that is more of a ooh sound, a lure. Right. So it's the lure valley. Again, I'm sure CL said it better than me. Yeah. We'll, we'll roll with that. Well, I mean, I haven't been to either place, so maybe I, I've said them wrong, but... Thanks for the help, Christine. We appreciate it. Absolutely. And this is, I'm going to call it a self-imposed-ish semi-correction. Sure. I mean, we didn't get it from a listener. You're the one who came yeah. up with it. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, there is some doubt in the uh, episode on the Battle of the Little Bighorn slash Greasy Grass. There is some doubt as to whether or not Crazy Horse actually said it is a good day to die. Right. So, I found that quote in a legitimate book. Yes. But then, Craig, when you went to find some pronunciation help, you found... Yes. So I was poking around on the eminent academic source that is YouTube. <laughs> yes. I, I hope you're picking up sarcasm <laughs> there. That's that's usually not a... I don't go there for academic stuff. I, it's a great place culturally. So I'll, I, I will go there if I can't find a local who can help me with pronunciation. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean... I got a lot of help actually on the, on that episode. So, uh, Keisha, we're going to get to you some more later. But thank you again for sending me copious files, right, with with correct pronunciation. But before she was able to get me the correct way to say "hoka hey," and my intonation is never going to be right, but it is a "hey." Yeah, I, I I was saying that wrong initially. The Lakota man who uploaded the video that I watched, he mentioned that Hokahe is sometimes mistranslated as it is a good day to die. So when I hear that, even though it was a very eminent historian who had written that, or, or rather, it's not like he's alone, but this eminent historian who had quoted Crazy Horse as saying it's a good day to die, it's quite possible that that historian was using a mistranslation. Yeah, that's that's what I'm wondering, because Ho Hokahe is used multiple well he definitely said that at the battle there's no question that crazy horse said that mm -hmm. but it leads me to conclude mm, there's a good chance that he didn't mean it's it, a good day to die yes and is it possible that he still said that on top of it sure but it's dubious enough in my mind now that i would rather bring that to the table yeah absolutely um and from there we go to not a correction. Not a correction. Yeah. Just something really cool and fun that we learned from um, a listener, Jesse. Yes, Jesse out in Texas. And 
It, you, you go ahead. I've already been yakking oh, too much. Oh, yeah. Come no. On. So Jesse let us know that he used to work as a funeral assistant. And he knows and shared with us, we did not know, that embalming in the United States became popular during the Civil War. It's a technology that had been around for a couple of decades before the Civil War. But it became popular in the U.S. because they needed a way to get bodies home to their families without rotting. Yes. <laughs> Which sounds... Anyway, um, pretty morbid, but, you know, so actually uh, we did a little more digging on this. Thank you, Jesse, for bringing it to our attention and found a Smithsonian Magazine article that talks about how Lincoln chose to be embalmed and he was the first president to be embalmed. I do think Jesse mentioned that in his email. Oh, yes, he He did. did. Jesse. Yes. Jesse mentioned that. Confirmed by Smithsonian. Yeah. Not that we don't trust you, Jesse, but we don't trust anyone. This is (laughs) this is how we research. (laughs) <laughs> Anytime someone tells us something, we then verify it in like four sources. Right. And then I mispronounce it. Yeah. So yeah. That's pretty much how it goes. That basically sums it up. Yeah. So the Smithsonian Magazine article did tell us this, though, did tell us that the Lincolns actually had Willie, their son, involved in 1862 so that they could get his body home to Illinois from Washington, D.C. Um, so Which, yeah. it just makes so much sense. I mean, you're talking about a world of trains. That is the fastest mode of transportation. You're still days, weeks, potentially. Days. And, well, and then you're talking lack of refrigeration. Yeah. So, you know, maybe if it's cold, the body shows up in better shape. But if it's a hot, if it's hot summer, no. Well, and you did have, so now I'm pulling up memories of being able to visit Lincoln's grave mm-hmm. in, uh, in Illinois. Um, so the cemetery in which he's interred actually has like the... The one of the vaults that his body moves around a number of times. In fact, yeah. we detailed that as I we recall. Did. Mm-hmm. But yeah, the, the one of them is kind of in the ground. Like there's a big hill, and they've dug into that hill intentionally to essentially make something of a colder space. It's definitely not a refrigerator level, but it's something. Yeah, yeah, to protect it from huge swings in temperature. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, we learned that that is how um, embalming came to be. The accepted American tradition that it came yeah. to be was started in the Civil War. So thanks, Jesse. Yes. So, you know, uh, your, your factoid on uh, maybe understanding American burial customs just a titch better. Crazy the things that can be rooted in there. Right. You know? Right. I mean, not that they don't involve in other places besides the United States. <laughs> yes, they and, do. Of course. <laughs> but, um, yeah. Yeah. How it got started in the U.S. It's interesting stuff. All right. Well, correction, fun notes into look let's just say not as fun stuff huh yeah let's just say the difficult meat of this episode yeah yeah or volume yes yes um this th- there's just no two ways about it this is one of the the darker harder periods of american history right we've made it through the civil war and you know for me and i think probably a lot of listeners i was really looking for a lighter note a, a happy ending and the Civil War just yeah. doesn't get us that. It really doesn't. The Civil War leads right into difficult eras of Reconstruction, difficult continuation of Indian Wars. Um, and it's it's really, it's hard stuff to know about. So, geez, there are a few, few different ways we need to go about this on both breaking down Reconstruction and the Indian Wars. We're going to start with a more complicated figure. I mean, this is a complicated era and time so we're, we're going to our our most complicated confederate without yes. a question yeah james old pete longstreet yes and i think that his uh life story his life philosophies and the, the actions and choices of his life really show just how complicated reconstruction is because he is such a complicated person yeah so i mean You've been through the episodes with us, then you you know him well. You're very familiar with our with our buddy old Pete, this Confederate general. I mean the the old war horse, as Bobby Lee, Robert E. Lee, mm-hmm. affectionately referred to him. This man was a major Confederate general. Yes, and he he was definitely raised in the South to believe in states' rights. Yes, and he signed up to fight for the Confederacy. That was very much a choice. Uh, it doesn't seem like it was as conflicted as a choice as like a Robert E. Lee had. He was pretty much all in. Well, he he was definitely, I mean, he, he was, 
his patriotism was rooted in part within the concept of states' rights. And right. I think, not that we want to rehash the Civil War by any means, but that's part of understanding the complexities of some of the the men who are going to war for the Confederacy, especially at the beginning of the war when it's, you haven't gotten to the drafts yet on both sides and yeah. and things haven't dragged out. Uh, he's in a corner of the South where, yes, there's this strong tradition of states' rights. And so it, it becomes a, a very clear path, I guess you could say. Yeah, yeah. So he fights through the war, but then uh, after the war, he's granted a pardon. Yep. And he does, he has a major shift in thinking. Yeah. yeah. He, I mean, he's a, he becomes a radical Republican. Yeah, not just a Republican, a radical Republican. And you were saying earlier, Greg, that you really think that that shows genuine conversion. Yeah. I mean, this isn't somebody who is looking around and at least in my mind, okay, that's, this is my own analysis here, but you, you don't, you don't go 180 degrees if it's just an attempt to assuage the powers that be. So right. the radical Republican, um, you know, portion of, of Congress is, is starting to get its way on Reconstruction. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, he's down here in the South. He's losing points by getting on board with, with the radical Republicans. Oh, he's losing a lot of points. He's not just losing points. He's losing friends. I mean, there are a lot of societies that are set up, uh, Daughters of the Confederacy and whatnot, and he is, he's not invited to their parties. Yep. Uh, he's not invited to publish a memoir or publish a book the way that so many other Confederate leaders are and Confederate generals are. Um, his side of the story really gets, gets sidelined, really, um, because it's oh, not popular. It's not popular with ex-Confederates. And so that for me is where I look at it and I feel like that's that's a pretty genuine thing. You mm -hmm. don't, you know, that there was nothing really, yes, okay, he, he gets employment because he does end up working for the for the, the government. Yeah, All sure. Right. So he gets a job out of becoming a Republican. So, I mean, sure, if you want to be super cynical, I guess you can, you can lean on that. Mm -hmm. But there are other ways to make a living. There are. And there are plenty of people, uh, you know, carpetbaggers and scalawags who were definitely just doing it for the job. Yeah. But I think that old Pete's actions show that he was very much all in. This was very genuine. I think his actions at the Battle of Liberty Place in 1874 really show that. Yes. That he, you know, he's he's putting his life on the line for his newfound ideals. Yeah. So I, I think it's worth thinking about and, and looking at him partly because he drops out he drops out of the narrative. He does. I mean, he's not a Republican loyalist from day one. Yeah, he's no Thaddeus Stevens, right? Yeah. Who's always been so principled. And, you know, he's no Charles Sumner. Well, and, and not to say that uh, old Pete is, un, not to imply that he's the opposite of, of Thaddeus Stevens in terms no. of lacking principles, but just, you know, the Republicans aren't going to look to a Johnny come lately. No. Who no. was a Confederate who had to receive a pardon from the federal government because he was a Confederate general, right? Mm -hmm. Like anyone who's involved at, at this level, if they ever want to vote again, even they, they had to receive a pardon, right? So, right. and and there were plenty of those given, but yeah. yeah, this is this isn't someone that you see the you know Civil War veterans, the the Union lining up to pat on the back. I, plenty of these men are still going to see him as the person who indirectly is responsible for their brother being dead or whatever the case may be. Right, right. Who fought against them on the battlefield. And because there are so many readily available, um, nicely packaged Republican exactly. heroes, James Longstreet just doesn't fit that. He's more complicated than that. Meanwhile, he's become honestly the the bane of Southern society. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, he, he does not, uh, he basically tanks his reputation the way he's he's seen by by his peers yes yeah by his you know throughout ex, the south his ex-compatriots yeah. yeah yeah um so i think that that brings us to a really interesting overarching point about well the reconstruction era but then about why he gets left behind by history so we see that he hasn't 
He hasn't cleanly fit into one side or the other, into a good guy or bad guy or into Democrat or Republican. Well, it, yeah, good guy, bad guy, depending on which side you're on, right? Exactly. So for the the union, he's always tainted as having, quote unquote, been a bad guy or union, you know, Republicans, Northerners, whichever yeah. uh, <laughs> term you want to roll <laughs> whichever with. Whichever of the complicated yes. terms you want, yeah. And meanwhile, you know, he's he's seen as a traitor who has left the good side in the mm-hmm. eyes of... Uh, Southerners, the you know, and f- former Confederates. He's he, so he kind of slips into the cracks there. And mm-hmm. uh, but I really like studying him. I like thinking about him. Um, it brings to mind this quote I came across long, long ago, back back as a grad student. Maybe okay. Maybe that's not like long, long. It's a pretty long time. Long, long, okay, all right, <laughs> it's fine. I'll make peace with that. Uh, but uh, David Canadine a professor of history at at Princeton, he said, the older I get, the more I'm convinced that it's the purpose of politicians and journalists to say the world is very simple, whereas it's the purpose of historians to say, no, it's very complicated. And hey, nothing but love to your cousin who works at whatever newspaper, all right? Just, sure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> or the or politicians who are listening. Um, but it, you know, historians, we live in a world where it's our job to get into this nitty gritty, and and we we have that um, luxury, I guess, uh, the benefit of hindsight, of distance, and in a world of papers turn around fast, uh, people wanting you to play a side in in politics. Yes, you can see where I mean, that's part of what I enjoy about the quote. You you can see where the dynamics actually press us to have these very simple two-dimensional answers Mm -hmm. in in our present. Yeah, when in reality, it's a much more complicated three-dimensional problem or person. Yep. Yeah. But that that doesn't work in a 240-character tweet. No. No, it doesn't. So, all right. Well, um, I want to get into the parties themselves. Look at how Republicans and Democrats have re well, maybe reinvent is a strong word, but where they're at as we get into Reconstruction. But we'll take a quick break. Before we do that, let you recharge your energy or whatever. <laughs> we'll, we'll just we'll, skip we'll, ahead and join the conversation. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> so, yeah, so let's look at the platforms of the Republican and Democratic Party during Reconstruction, because in this era, they have pretty distinct platforms. That's not always the case in history, but in this era, it really is. Yes. So, um, well, it's worth remembering that, of course, we've got the radical Republicans, that the Republicans themselves have their... Yeah, they have wings. Yes, have their wings. Mm -hmm. Um, But... Overall, you know, Republicans, they they want to control, well, everyone wants to control Reconstruction, I suppose we could say. Yeah, they want to control Reconstruction at a federal level. <laughs> yes, yes. So, and, and within that, the radical Republicans are pushing very hard for Black equality. Yes. So, full-on equality, white, Black Americans. Same civil rights. Yes. Here we go, moving forward. And as a result, because that is their main goal, they are absolutely fine with... Uh, military occupation of former Confederate states mm-hmm. or any other measure that they say, this is our goal and we're going to get to it. They they are fine with that. And, yeah. Well, and we see the difference in that perspective with um, Andrew Johnson when he's president. You mm-hmm. might remember the conversation. <laughs> I mean, it's it's a painful conversation. The one he's having with Frederick Douglass that yes. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> see all your, that face, the, that the was sigh. just golden. That was great. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, That was a really uncomfortable chat. And in it, Andrew says, Andy, the Tennessee Taylor. Andy. He he makes his point to to Frederick is that it it would be wrong in his mind to force a state to have civil rights Mm -hmm. for black Americans. That seems crazy to us in the 21st century. In his mind, at least as he's presenting it, um, that is uh, him respecting the democratic process within that state. Yeah. That would be the democratic view. 
at, at this juncture. Yeah, history. that's the Democratic Party's view. So they are very much um, looking at, they would like to have reconstruction happen on a state level. So, you know, occupation of a state by the U.S. Army seems like a real bad idea. Seems like a real threat to federalism. And and that's where they start to come up with the term home rule. Home rule. Yes. Yeah. So home rule then leads to more. We we see that home rule is quickly translating to those in power wanting to reestablish essentially status quo from before the war. Exactly. So, okay, slavery has gone in language. Andrew Johnson was even down with the 13th Amendment. He didn't put up any qualms about that, but he certainly had qualms about real structural changes to society. Right. About, you know, then enforcing that and really actually enforcing it. And so that's where you come up with, which we discussed in our Reconstruction episodes, like the Mississippi Plan, where states figure out how are we going to restore the mm-hmm. status quo antebellum. Yes, right? The wh- How it was before the war. And so that's where you come up with the KKK, the White League, these very militant, basically militant arms. Most historians would agree that they're yeah. militant arms of the Democratic Party. Uh, that point was made by, I mean, we pour over both the primary sources as we write these episodes and the secondary sources. So in history talk, we'd call that the historiography. This is what other historians have said. And you know, that that changes over time, of course. Sure. So a historian who really knows their stuff, you know, they could even tell you, for instance, the historiography of Reconstruction is that it had a far more basically lost cause bend mm-hmm. up until, frankly, uh, about civil rights era. So yeah, and the, even beyond a little bit. Yeah, so, so the dominant narrative uh, was really the big bad federal government that was over domineering and pushing around the states and it, by about you know into the 70s 80s as we came out of civil rights and on more and more historians have gone well wait a minute we're we're actually we're, we're looking at a federal government that's looking to uh, hand out civil rights to all of its citizens right and that it's fighting against you know the KKK we've we've got a white supremacist group that is it's killing people i mean we mm-hmm. We'd call that terrorism in right. in present parlance, and so as, as that's come more and more to the fore, that's where the, the historiography has gone. Point being, we pour over all this stuff, and uh, I can't think of a present historian that really disagrees. Uh, no, no, there really isn't. So, yeah. yeah, most present historians here in the 21st century would say that what the KKK and the White League were. Um, the militant wing, the more radical wing of the yeah. Democratic Party, there to um, Mili- use military means to impose what they're calling self, uh, you know, home rule. Right, right, and to get rid of and to fight against the Republican agenda of equality for white and black Americans. Yes, which again they're seen as being imposed in a um, unconstitutional manner. Right, by the the federal government through the use of military might. Right. But, you know, even backing up a step from that, that militarized wing, Mm -hmm. then you've got court decisions that take a look at the 13th, 14th and 15th Amendments and say, you know, there's another way for us to take the teeth out of these, for us to block this radical Republican agenda. Right. And they make court decision after court decision leading, you know, across the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s that really... Um, yeah, again, take the teeth out, cut yeah, a no, bunch that's of holes a great into. Yeah. yeah, just punctures, essentially. Uh, I mean, if it'd be like if, if you had a canteen that's supposed to hold water, right? And each of these little court decisions are kind of just putting pinholes in it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you let that continue for two, three decades. And that's where, you know, when we mentioned this in the last Reconstruction episode that, yeah, we kind of tend to look at the election of... Um, Rutherford Hayes as president is kind of like the end of Reconstruction. That's just because, again, we're two-dimensional human beings. And we love clean endings. We love clean endings. So we can be like, yep, this is Reconstruction. Put it in a box, call it good. But in truth, you know, it, it's not as though Reconstruction is dead in the, in the moment of that election. There are still mm-hmm. lingering Black legislators 
and and activists and yes, yeah, civil rights workers who are out there working, but and, and they don't disappear. I mean, no, they there don't. are eminent figures. We'll get to them later. Yeah, and we're going to get to Ida B. Wells and yes. all of those people who are you know they are there. They are they're very visible. They're very active fighting for black rights. But these court decisions that take all of the power out of the Fourteenth Amendment, all of the power out of the Thirteenth Amendment, they really allow Jim Crow to become the the legal status of the day. Yeah. And and that's why you know I, I mean I've I remember always thinking, well, not that I understand <laughs> civil rights movement. <laughs> but when you read the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment, just taking it on surface level, you, you can kind of scratch your head and think like, how did this not work right out the gate? Right. So you know, it's these court rulings. And mm -hmm. uh, of course, it's being a survey. We won't get to every single one of them, but we will definitely, you're, you're going to hear about those down the road. So, you know, Plessy v. Ferguson is probably the most famous. Yeah, that's the most well-known. And that's not even till 1896. Precisely. So we still have Reconstruction getting slowly torn apart mm -hmm. bit yeah. by bit. Yeah, across the second half of the 18th, of the 1800s. But that is why the legislation of the 1950s and 1960s was necessary. Yeah. It was because you had to give the power back to these amendments that the court decisions had taken away. Because those court decisions, they set precedents, and then those yep. precedents are used for future rulings. Right. So you needed laws that would then change the way that a court, that, that a judge, who, if they're doing their job right, they're going to look at the way precedents have been decided previously. At least this actually starts to get into some discussion about what judges do. And, sure. You know, um, um, because certainly there is, there are some instances where where judges have uh, said no, this was decided incorrectly the first time around, and, mm -hmm. and then that sets a different precedent. <sighs> Anyhow, I mean this is <laughs> this is a whole nother bag to get into, and, and we'll get to all this stuff. But when Congress writes a bill and it becomes a law, that liberates, I guess you could say, uh, judges who would be held felt held by a, a previous precedent to be able to really say okay. This you know we've we've had a real rule change. Now we can interpret in a different way. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Anything else we're going to say on that? I think that's it. I think that that's what we needed so. to cover for Reconstruction. Yeah. I mean, cause, and we're obviously going to get into these these episodes more later. But yeah. Yeah. We we can't get ahead of ourselves. No. We'll we'll leave it there for now. We don't want to give away too much of the story. All right. So we'll take just one more one more break here, and then we'll hit Indian Wars. Perfect. And welcome back. So, Indian Wars. Yeah. Now, what we covered for this section was really Indian Wars in Western America for a few decades. And yeah. obviously, in our first episode, we did a fairly quick and broad overview of the multiple Indian Wars that have been happening since the beginning of United States history. Yes. Um, but, you know, then we kind of zoomed in on Western America. Right. And I mean, part of the, I mean, it's a challenge doing this survey of U.S. history. It is. Truly, it is. It is not easy fitting in all the things in in a narrative fashion, not just in a single episode, but in terms of trying to think about that. How does this whole narrative work overall? I mean, we, uh, for instance, the, the U.S.-Dakota War, we thought about making that an episode a year ago. Yeah. But ultimately decided it was just going to be too jarring uh, to insert something that kind of feels off topic almost amidst the Civil War. The Civil War was already, good grief, so many episodes. It was. It was so, so many long. Parts. Yeah. And so we decided, you know, we're just going to, we'll circle back to this. We're going to leave it on the shelf for a minute. And then we do a series of. Indian episodes, which yeah. apparently we decided to do with Reconstruction and perhaps just depress a whole lot of people. Yes. But, <laughs> we're sorry that we took 2020 even further <laughs> further down for any of you we, who are already having a tough year. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, but we we go through U.S. history. I mean, that's that's the survey. Yeah, you can't skip it, right? No, yeah. Because it, it's uncomfortable or unhappy. Or, no, that would make us, uh, that in my mind would, would, would be uh, uh, unethical. Sure. So, sure. Um, we we got to cover it. Um, and so, anyhow, so we 
we, we put it together because, I mean, just like if you're reading a, a textbook, you know, it, mm-hmm. units are organized in a certain way uh, to make the most sense. So, yes, we we put them together and we've definitely overlapped on time period. <laughs> yeah. I do think, though, that there was some value to being able, you know, to talk about the U.S. Dakota War and being able to, for instance, where Lincoln makes, you know, an, an ominous large decision to be able to mm-hmm. put into context, you know, I'm assuming that for many of you listening, you can be like, right, yeah, I know what Lincoln was going through at the time. We can mention the names of some big battles and generals really in passing. But give some context. Right. Yeah, so we understand what's happening in other parts of the country. Yeah, it was nice to be able to play into that. Yeah. All right, I'm sorry. I nerded out a little too much on... That's okay. All right. Let's just dive into a little bit more on um, the Indian Wars themselves. So we've talked to, I mean, we've read several different historians and talked to um, members of different uh, Native American tribes. Yep. And just some overarching themes that have come up is um, what one historian, he's a Canadian historian, actually, Anton Truet, and he, he makes the point that reading and learning about Indian Wars can be pretty brutal not can be, is yeah. pretty brutal. It's pretty difficult things to talk about and to learn about. Um, and he says that the one silver lining that he finds is not that um, the Indian Wars happened, but that the tribes, and so many of the tribes, have found ways to survive and keep their cultural traditions alive to the 21st century through the brutality that happened to them. You know, one of the interesting things, um, so I'm going to go ahead and mention uh, Keisha. She's become a good friend in, mm-hmm. in this process. And thanks again. I actually did mention her earlier in the episode. But uh, Keisha Little Bear, oh, I'm going to mess up the second half of her last name. But Keisha Little Bear Citron, she, uh, she's Northern Cheyenne and uh, has been listening for, for quite a while. And so uh, we exchanged a few messages and I knew as I was getting to the battle of the little bighorn. Yeah, I want some some perspective and right. a lot of help with pronunciation. Yes. <laughs> so, yes. <laughs> so that was enormously useful. But I was uh um well a little surprised, I guess, uh, when she told me that in traveling at times, when Keisha's mentioned that she's Northern Cheyenne, mm-hmm. indigenous, you know, uh, Native American, that she's met a number of people who's, who are shocked that she is uh, an indigenous person because they didn't realize there were indigenous people today. Yes. And I obviously we're all to some degree, the reflection of kind of where we grow up and our experiences. Mm-hmm. So I, I personally found that kind of it. Oh, it was weird for me. I mean, I guess just growing up in the West. Right. That, I mean, both Greg and I grew up in the West. And so we have known a lot of Native Americans. Yeah. We uh, have traveled through and been to Native or Indian reservations. Uh, that was not a surprise. What was a surprise was that Keisha said, please make sure that people know we're still here. Yeah. So, hey, I'm I'm happy to, you know, <laughs> still and I are happy to, if you weren't aware of that, let's go ahead and just set the record straight on that. Yep. Keisha's a, a person. And yes. that feels actually a little more ominous to say after covering Standing, Standing Bear. Bear's trial, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Uh, yes, indeed. I mean, a, a person and here and, you know, still here today. Right. Um, right along with that, you know, as, as we were working on, I mean, getting to that episode, you know, talking about Standing Bear mm-hmm. within that, we also had the Nez Pierce and Chief Joseph. And yeah, that was, I mean, uh, that's another heartbreaking t- tale. Mm-hmm. Man, 40 miles shy of the Canadian border. Oh, yeah. But uh, the flag for the Nez Pierce Nation, which again is a thing, it exists today. Um, yeah, absolutely. So this flag that still exists for the Nez Pierce Nation today shows so many things about their heritage and about who they are today and where they've come from. Yeah, so it has the shape of the reservation. You might have, you might recall me describing it at one point, kind mm-hmm. of elongated, um, you know, five sided. A scholar, I can't remember which which one it was, but um, one of them described it as being almost coffin shaped. That kind of works. Yeah. And the uh, in the middle of the flag is an image of uh, Chief Joseph, and around him is a circle, and in it, it says Nez Pierce Tribe Treaty of uh, eighteen fifty five. 
Right. So, I mean, this flag, right? Here's here's this flag by which they represent themselves. You can see how so much of their memory and, and thoughts are focused on this particular moment in time. Right. Yeah, that they were they were a peaceful people who had made a treaty and they were sticking to it. Um, and they're still they're still telling that story. Well, and that 1855 treaty, as you know, maybe some people remember it's it's so seared into our heads after right. <laughs> pouring over the material and writing these episodes. Uh old Joseph, Chief Joseph's father, he mm-hmm. wouldn't sign that. No. You know, so it you know, they, yeah, you've got the 1855 treaty there represented on the flag, but it still doesn't even speak to an agreement that was made by... The whole tribe? Just, yeah. Just part, right? Yeah, I remember um, reading old Joseph's reactions to the treaty. Like, you can't just partition land. You can't sell land, you, nor could you sell air, which, of course, in 21st century America, of course you can sell air. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Airspace, that's a thing we discuss all the time, right? Drones, that's an issue. Right, right. Um, but well, yeah, you that do is, see this. that's an American concept, well, it, not an indigenous concept. Yeah, and it's it's a it's a very clash, you know, it's a moment where where you have a very serious clash of uh concepts of Yes, very uh, values of cultures mm-hmm. that there really just isn't middle ground. There there's very little compromise and yeah, that treaty is a good example well, of that. That was, it, it was quite interesting to me to see as, um, you know, as I was pouring over a lot of this stuff, where there was often, you know, kind of this pattern, we laid it out at the end of the last uh, episode mm-hmm. of initially a, a few explorers or settlers show up and we have this phase where there's plenty of coexistence and it's fine. Yep. And for me, again, this is just my take, but something that kind of clicked was thinking on, Right. For for a lot of these indigenous peoples, and I'm also taking it, I'm extrapolating from some of the context of things that I read them saying in these mm-hmm. treaty negotiations. They had, um, I mean, the, the, the land isn't something that they would ever say to, to a new newly arrived explorer. Like you, you can't be there because that's ours. The, the, they're more caretakers of the land, I believe, is is the the right term. Right. Yeah. There are many tribes that really are like, all right, we're sharing. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, they are very much coexisting and so, with the animals and the other people on yeah. the land. And so that philosophy, when you then get to a treaty that says, no, here are stark lines and you don't cross this line, we don't cross this line. Yeah. it. Uh, you can see where a lot's going to get... Oof, yeah. yeah, misunderstood. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and then, of course, we get past the the misunderstood and just into the... I mean, just the, the outright lies, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 You know, and I think that brings us to an interesting point that um, a modern historian has brought up. And when she said this, she was not speaking about Native American history, but I think it applies here. And I think it's interesting. She said, um, this is Sally Wagner. She said, history isn't what happened. It's who tells the story. And I think that with um, Indian Wars, we've only heard one side of the story for a long time. Uh, that's been very traditional. I mean, at least when I was in grade school, you know, I didn't know that the Battle of the Little Bighorn was also called the Battle of the Greasy Grass. I knew that the Battle of the Little Bighorn was also called Custer's Last Stand because I learned one side of the story right? told by one group. And um, perhaps don't you don't hear about how um, Custer plays a, a fascinating, precipitating role in that he's the one who was exploring in the Black Hills. Right. I mean, that is... Yeah, he's the pretty... one, his expedition is the one that's discovering gold in the Black Hills that's creating the whole problem to begin not, with. Not that he would know exactly what that's going to lead to for himself. No. But, uh, yeah, I mean, that that's the fuller picture. And I, I think that, I mean, fuller is the right word. Often... People get uh, a little afraid when we start getting into uh, history that's uncomfortable, mm-hmm. and we we can retreat to corners. And we want to well back to that two dimensional concept, right? Yeah. We, we we want good guy, bad guy, and you know, there we're better served to go with and statements instead of or statements. It's not mm-hmm. this is the story of this battle or of American history, or it's you know America. It was always getting it right or America's always got it wrong. 
there's mm -hmm. there are ands there are moments where you know the story looks different from a different perspective right and it's okay to to tell custer's side of the story what mm -hmm. a terrifying battle that would have been how terrifying it would have been to well, die on that hill even the the lakota and cheyenne um and arapaho men some of them are saying how sorry they're feeling for custer's men right like yes and, and you know there i certainly pause and think like what about some of these guys were we mentioned uh, an, an Italian recruit. Mm -hmm. like, these guys, some of them are green as can be. That's actually part of their problem. Yeah. You know, they've just enlisted. They're just trying to pay bills, perhaps, you know. Yeah. Uh, they, so they, they haven't been involved in this whole fight, but they don't realize what their predecessors have already done. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and so they they step into this. Um, What's the word I'm looking for? Mess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, it, it doesn't take away from the, the the sadness of of any human death, but wow, I mean, when you have the context, good grief, I I get where the Lakota and the Cheyenne and uh, you know the Arapaho are coming from. Yeah, and it's okay. It doesn't take away from Custer's side of the story to tell their side of the story, to hear both sides, and you know, we're really good at doing that. I think in the Civil War. Yeah, I think we're really good at doing that. We're really good at embracing, hey, this battle was called something else by the Confederates. This battle, um, there's two sides to the story. The Confederates said it this way. The Union soldiers said it this way. We're going to tell both. We're going to let both stories live. And I think that that's an important uh, lesson that can, we can apply to the Indian Wars as well. Well, yeah, and, and we did our best to do that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But we, we tried to point out some of the generals who are really conflicted. Yep. It's um, there are definitely some bad settlers. I think that's Absolutely. just without a question. I mean, we're we're reading about settlers that that murder or rape or steal cattle without provocation. So that or does all happen. Three. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but then we've we've also got you know the John Gibbon types who you know I I quoted him a number of times. This this guy is not comfortable with what's going on. No, he's and, not. So, you know, you can see kind of the wheels turning in, in his head and mm -hmm. trying to, you know. Yeah, uh, trying to make decisions based on orders that he's given versus what he's seeing on the ground. Yep. These are tough decisions. And you can see sometimes he's thinking, okay, well, how can I fight against this and get what's best for these indigenous peoples that I know and I'm trying to work with? Yeah. And also follow my bosses back in D.C. who are, you know, right in my paycheck. Well, and then you get to this uncomfortable place where they're, um, I'm thinking specifically of, of Oliver Howard, you know, his being nice has now gotten him dubbed as a quote unquote Indian lover. So there's actually a negative connotation right. for him, you know, following his conscience at junctures. Right. So that creates a negative loop. Right. Well, and then you've got the the George Crooks, who the indigenous peoples call three stars. Yes. <laughs> um, and George Crook has followed orders a lot. And then he's watched the outcomes. And he's, yeah. he's tired of it. He's tired of being this brutal person who forces Native Americans onto reservations with little to no supplies, little mm -hmm. to no food, not enough space. And watching what happens, watching the death and disease. Well, and I will also say... You know, the fact that he was well-respected by the time at least we get to, to Omaha, mm -hmm. he's he's well-respected and a, a number of indigenous peoples from different nations, they feel that they can trust him. Mm -hmm. That also speaks to him managing to find some sort of higher road that clearly a number of most of his colleagues are not finding. Right, right. Yeah. But by the time we, we met him in yeah. 1874. Don't quote me on that year. <laughs> 1870s. Come on, Seattle. You yeah. know, the secret of good history is to always back off when you're unsure. Exactly. On we met him in the 1870s, but by the time we've met him, he is determined to find a legal way to follow his orders and help Standing Bear. Thus, yeah. we end up with that trial. Yeah. And, you know, George Kirk allows himself to go on trial because he is it's like, well, this is the system we're going to use, and we're going to use this system to someone else's advantage. That's this right. Time. So, Standing Bear, sue me. Mm -hmm. That's that's how they play it. Yeah. Um, and you know, as that's going on, uh, I I just have to throw this in because it sat with me, and I kind of wish I had pointed this out in the episode. Um, 
sticking with that, but shifting back over to John Gibbon with the sure. Nez Pierce, mm-hmm. and you remember me saying this to you already, CL, but the the quote that I shared right before the the big hole, which that is one of the most uh, atrocious battles in in my estimation. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, th- this battle, right? Th- and I've got this quote right before we go into this battle from John Gibbon. Mm-hmm. And he, I mentioned he's speaking to a bishop and he starts his quote with, you knowing our gentle disposition, something to that effect. Basically, mm-hmm. hey, you know what good guys we are, right? So you can imagine how hard it was for us to hear this village of with babies crying and you know the humanity right. of it. He's talking to a bishop. And so I, I don't belabor this in the episode, but I mean, clearly this is a guy who's, he's looking for absolution. Yeah. This is a man racked with guilt. Right. He's bothered by, you know, his struggle to follow orders and hold on to his decency. Yeah. And I think that any soldier who has gone to war in a difficult place like that, and I think that there are probably a lot of soldiers in America in the 21st century who could relate to John Gibbon. And the difficulty of what they've seen, what they've seen other soldiers do, maybe even things they've participated in, right? That it's like, wow, this is really hard for me to swallow that I was following orders and this is what ended up happening. I definitely take your point. I, I do, um, I don't think you mean that like all U.S. soldiers commit atrocities. No, I just want to make sure we're not. <laughs> right. But I, I do think that a lot of soldiers see some no, pretty e- brutal things. Even when you're following orders, I say this as someone who has not been in uniform, and I, so I'm not going to even pretend, you know, I can grasp what, um, but, well, both of my grandfathers served in World War II, mm-hmm. and one of them was on the front lines of Italy. And um, it is our understanding from from what he passed on that I mean, he, he did actually disobey orders a, a time or two when mm-hmm. he was... At least in one instance, he was he was told to uh, shoot a German. They were in Italy, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, a German had stepped on one of their own mines, a German shoe mine. Oh, and the guy was yelling for help to the Americans. He's desperate at this point, right? Absolutely. And my grandfather's commanding officer said, "I, you need to shoot him. We need to end him. He's screaming. He's going to give away his, our position, mm-hmm. and we're all going to be dead." Like, I mean, think about the situation there, right? It, it, like, it's there is awful. no win-win, no, right? No. And I guess my my grandpa, you know, of course, family tradition. So you you, you kind of wonder about how things might, uh, I'm not trying to take away from my grandfather mm-hmm. here, but historian, I always have to be like, all right, what what really happened? But he hemmed and hawed, or he just, he wasn't quick on it. And uh, so the commanding officer just went to the next soldier and said, you do it. And in that moment, um, it was actually enough time for the German to see what was going on. I think my, if I remember right, my grandpa started to point his rifle and then Then maybe couldn't do it. And it was just enough time for the German to scurry behind a tree or a rock and he shut the hell up um, from that. And, you know, and it's haunted. I know that story because it's haunted my grandfather. Yes. Well, I mean, he's passed now, but it haunted him the rest of his life, wondering what happened to that German. Yeah. Yeah, the way that John Gibbon is haunted yes. by the things he's seen, the exactly. things he's seen other soldiers do in following orders. Right. These well, are brutal things. I don't believe, just knowing John Gibbon as I do from the sources, mm-hmm. I don't believe for a second that he was someone who was, you know, executing civilians, um, doing that sort of a thing. But he clearly, he was at the battle. He yeah. saw that stuff. Yeah. And I think that, yeah, I think that haunted him. Yeah. And, you know, I think that brings up a really good point that many of the soldiers, obviously not all of them, like the guys at the Battle of the Little Bighorn with uh, Custer, but many of these guys are Civil War hardened soldiers. Yes. They have seen combat. Definitely Crook, Phil Sheridan, you know, Gibbon, they have invented and then enforced total warfare. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the thing is, is when we talk about the Civil War, these are guys who are fighting for the Union, which we in the 21st century have dubbed the winners. Yep. Back and, to our two dimensions. Yeah. And therefore, the things they did in the Civil War were justified and it was fine. So when we talk about them going through the Shenandoah Valley and literally picking it clean, not caring 
or not, you know, being told not to care about the civilians who were left behind to starve. Which happened. Which absolutely happened. You know, we look at that and say, well, yes, but it was needed because we needed to win the Civil War. But those are the same things that are happening out West because this is the warfare that these men have learned. Mm -hmm. They are they are comfortable waging war on civilians. They have learned to do it. Yeah. And, and those lessons, I, they have a hard time leaving. So a lot of the soldiers, you wonder why. Why didn't everybody disobey orders? Well, they this, they knew how to do this. Right. I mean, and they've learned that this is how war works. Yes. Yes. They have experience. And they know this is how you win a war. Yeah. I mean, Phil, Phil Sheridan <laughs> yeah. was excellent at that very uh at that very process and well and i guess you know that this is kind of the uh, a last major thing to really bring home is that when it comes to history if, if we're doing you know good and, and honest history which um we try to we here <laughs> really try to we <laughs> that's our goal literally lose sleep over it um you you do not it, it's not a fairy tale you just don't mm -hmm. get if you're looking for good guys and bad guys you will be disappointed pretty much every time yeah um i, I even i kind of think back to episode one within the first five minutes i, I think it was mm -hmm. right i make this point about how george washington is put on a pedestal by yeah. some people right and some people want him on it and then that leads others to overreact they want him off that pedestal and i think that applies to all u.s history it applies to all history all peoples yeah. every individual right so you know phil sheridan Yes, great hero on the right side, as we term it today, of the Civil War. Mm -hmm. But he says the only good Indian, at least he's alleged to have said, the only good Indian I've ever met was a dead one. Yeah. Right? So, And if he didn't say those exact words, the he thought them. He, yeah, he did. Um, you know, th these are the th more complicated, complex, you know, uh, people that we get into. I mean, Phil Sheridan is also a great advocate for Black Americans. Yes, he So is. why is he an advocate for Black Americans, but not for Indigenous Americans? This is reality. This is the complexity of history, of, of people, mm -hmm. what, um, you know, prejudices have been, have been introduced, to what extent. Yeah, these are three-dimensional figures. They have shiny, nice sides. Yeah. They have really dark sides, just like all of us. Yeah. So, I mean, I, and I'm not making an argument for moral relativism here, but, no. you know, the, the good guys do bad things. The bad the bad guys do good things. Mm -hmm. Sometimes good things are done for the wrong motivations and, you know, vice versa. Wrong things are done. Uh, U Ulysses Grant as president with his peace policy, I feel like that is a very good man who has very noble ambitions. And his peace policy towards the indigenous population, it, it's, it's, it's not... It's not working. It's, yeah, yeah, it is. It's it's unworkable, and right. he, he can't enforce it, and it doesn't get enforced. I uh, frankly, I I love Grant. The, he's one of these people that the more I learn about him, for the most part, you know, the more I think of him, mm -hmm. my esteem increases. Um, you know, but he's a human being, and he's going to make wrong decisions. Yeah, as we all do, and uh, those have huge ramifications. Yeah, when you're yeah. president. They absolutely do. So yeah, it, it's just it's so important to tell the whole story yeah. about any person and and if we can not expect perfection right. from our historical figures we can realize that their lives are as complicated and difficult as ours mm -hmm. um yeah. you know and include those and statements like yes. you were saying earlier don't jump to the or statements jump to the and statements mm -hmm. phil sheridan did this good thing and, and this bad thing quote unquote yeah yeah well i don't know if there's a better note to wrap up on than on that huh yeah i, I mean think th so. these are really hard subjects um honestly it's it's the sort of thing where i wish all of you could be in a classroom with me and we could have an actual discussion uh, it's mm -hmm. one of the one of the frustrations of it all being you know over a mic and so one dimension or not one dimensional one directional right um but i hope that you've gotten a lot of good information and, and things for, for you to think about and mm -hmm. be able to discuss. Right. Well, making a very radical shift in topic, CL, you're, I'm leaving, you're leaving. I'm leaving HTDS. This is my last episode with HTDS. It's, um, 
there are a lot of exciting things happening in my life that make it palatable to leave. <laughs> um, but it is, it's hard. It's hard to acknowledge. So um, for the past year and a half, I've been getting a master's in academic advising and I'll graduate um, this coming August. And in the meantime, um, I have re- I've accepted a position as an academic advisor actually at the same university where Greg currently works. So I think our paths will still cross occasionally. They yeah, sure will. Yeah. yeah. Oh, we, we'll still see each other. I'm going to miss working with you on, on this, though. And I'm I mean, going to miss working with you on this. I mean, I'm, I'm excited to launch a new part of my career. Absolutely. And I'm excited for you. As I told you from... <laughs> it is kind of funny thinking about both you and Josh and the like, I don't know, you had a similar facial expression <laughs> each of you when you when you break me this news. I I'm happy, you know, I'm I'm so happy for Josh. He is doing fantastic. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and I'm happy for you. And uh obviously, uh, you know, I I'm I miss working with Josh. Right. Um, yeah. We, we love Lindsay and Airship. Um but it's not like Josh disappeared. I I have seen the man a few times. Mm-hmm. You know, and yeah, we'll bump into each other on campus and definitely I'll I'm gonna have to figure out what epilogues look like. But Yeah, there won't be these conversations no, anymore. That will be different. No, they won't. Um but I'm happy for you. I'm sure everyone listening is happy for you. Thanks. Yes. So yeah. All right. I guess that does it. I I guess it does. So for the last time I'll say goodbye to everyone. And I hope you keep, um, well, I, I know you'll keep enjoying the podcast. Oh, shucks. Well, see, I'll go ahead and sign us out here. All right. Join us. Join us in two weeks where Greg will tell you a story. History That Doesn't Suck is created and hosted by me, Greg Jackson. Researching and writing by Greg Jackson and C.L. Salazar. Production by Airship. Sound design by Derek Barron. Theme music composed by Greg Jackson. Arrangement and additional composition by Lindsey Graham of Airship. For bibliography of all primary and secondary sources consulted in writing this episode, visit htdspodcast.com. HTDS is supported by fans at patreon.com forward slash history that doesn't suck. CL and I are beyond grateful to you kind souls providing funding to help us keep going. Thank you. And a special thanks to our patrons whose monthly gift puts them at producer status. Will Caldwell, Jason Carstens, John Frugal Dougal, Michael and Rachel Ercolini, Bob Drazovich, Keith Downer, Drew Hill, Andrew Fortunati, Bryce Hancock, Brad Herman, Dax Jones, John Leach, Jeffrey Moose, and Brandon Shaw. Join me in two weeks where I'd like to tell you a story.